Sam Manzer, I'm an independent developer based right out here in Austin. Um, and I've been working on this project for a little bit called Mock All the Things. Um, kind of came out of my, some of my frustrations with uh, how painful the te processes around testing and CI, CD were at places that I've worked in the past. Um, I think probably a lot of folks in this room have had similar frustr frustrations. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about that, um, talk about kind of what I've been prototyping um, to maybe get a little bit more efficient, uh, less painful process um, for ensuring that the software that we build has the quality that we want. Um, so uh, I kind of wanted to start out with like kind of how the cycle often goes, or at least in some of the uh, more dysfunctional places I've worked in the past. So, uh, you know, when you, you try to get your code under test, um, get your new feature built and get it with the quality that you want, um, a lot of times, uh, well, first you kind of fight with uh, different people on your team with different opinions about whether TDD is the answer or not. Um, and, uh, you know, I've uh, kind of oscillated between my different opinions on that over the years. Um, and so uh, I have no opinion on that right now. but. Basically, depending on, so we'll go through both scenarios. Um, if the TDD side loses, you end up writing some code. Then uh, you write some tests after that, um, try to get it all covered. Um, and then the way it usually goes is you have to ship. Um, you ship, you don't have quite the coverage that you want. Um, and then you hot fix whatever goes wrong in production. Um, if you go the other way, uh, then you write, you write a lot of tests, write code to go with it. Um, you ship it, and you got your test done. Um, but then when you need to implement a new feature, um, at least sometimes when I've done this, you end up spending way too much time refactoring all the tests, and they end up being kind of a burden on you. Um, so you know there can be a lot of frustrations with these types of things. Um, and you know the way I always hoped that this would work is like um, you just you know write some code like we like to do. Um, and then you, you know you verify it works, and I put quotes around like works because you know the devil's in the details with that, right? And that's a lot of what the tests are sort of supposed to define for you is this is what works means, and so that you know that that won't ever change with the subsequent code changes that you make. But a lot of times we kind of know what works, right? Like you you write a feature, you know you you make a table in a database, you add an endpoint to your API, and you draw something on the screen in your browser window in response to that data that you pulled from the API. You do all those things, and then you load up the page, you click around, and you're like, okay, this works. Um, and ideally, that would kind of be the end of it, right? Like if you can capture that. Like, this is what works means, and I don't want that to change when someone else breaks the code, then you're kind of just done, right? And you have a test that accurately represents the behavior that you want your code to maintain, and you can just keep shipping features, and you don't have to waste time with this stuff. Um, so it's, it's great to try to approach this, you know, as much as we can. Um, and, you know, in doing so with the goal, you know, we want to have the goal that. You know, our code ends up being reliable. Um, we spend as much time as we can really focusing on delivering business value rather than focusing on process. Um, and that we get, you know, ultimately that, you know, the tests, we're doing the tests because they work for us. They're delivering value to us. They're making our code more stable and not, you know, just like going through this kind of common experience of you try to make one small change out of parameter somewhere, or do like a little refactor and like this huge, you get this huge, you know, lot, big pile of red on your screen from all the tests that are broken that you now have to also refactor um, and your feature takes much, much longer than it should. Um, so kind of what I want to suggest is just a little bit of rethinking of the kind of pyramid diagram that we kind of see a lot. Um, this is kind of the traditional way to think about testing, the hierarchy of different types of testing that you do on your software before you ship it. Um, right? We start with strong, strong base of unit tests covering a large portion of our code. Um, usually, you know, often organizations will target like, okay, we want like 85% uh, unit test coverage, something like that. Um, other times, you know, you, you take a different approach to quantifying it, but um, this is your base, and then you add the layers on top of that where you test the interactions of your system that your team's responsible for with other systems in your organization. And finally, you know, testing kind of how everything works together with the end-to-end -end tests at the top of the pyramid. And the reason it's shaped like a pyramid is because the perception is that the maintenance effort for the things 
more at the top of the pyramid um, is greater. They're more brittle. They're harder to maintain. And I think this matches a lot of people's practical experience, right? If you try to do, like, for example, a um, UI test end to end at the top of the pyramid, that kind of thing will break as soon as one of your buttons shifts over a little bit or something like that. And so, you know, that's kind of led to some, you know, trying to minimize the amount of those types of tests that we do. Um, but you, you can think about it a different way, right? Um, a lot of times, the high-level functionality is the stuff that is um, more stable due to stronger contracts with the people who are consuming it, right? If your team is responsible for some microservice um, that sends data with a particular schema, if you change it, all the other teams that are consuming it will yell at you. Unless, And so in a big organization, you have the kind of standard friction of you send an email saying, this change is coming, migrate by this date, and then the date gets pushed back and back, and eventually you migrate the other team's code yourself because they don't do it. But anyway, so like uh, this, this is kind of a standard thing. And if, so if you anchor your test at a high level, one, that high level code calls a whole bunch of lower level code all the way through the stack. Um, so you get a lot of coverage with relatively few individual test cases. And you um, don't have to change them as much because the interfaces are more stable. Um, so this approach of generally just trying to test at a higher level uh, is enabled by a lot of the modern technologies that we hear you know, about in all the other talks here today um, and that you know, kind of form the foundation for DevOps as a field, right? Containerization means you can spin up a whole other new copy of your app in a very stable environment very consistently, very quickly, and um, test it in a reproducible way. Um, and you know the orchestration tool is also great for that. There's you know so much new stuff around that. I don't know if you all have to check out like Jenkins X, for example. Um, just lets you spin up these self-contained environments really nice, really nicely, really quickly. Um, so the front-end community also has been building a lot of tools that take this high-level testing approach. Um, you know you'll see um, stuff like Selenium, Jest, Puppeteer. Um, all of these things kind of have a common emphasis on your ability to test like the whole behavior of a feature by simulating like a user actually clicking around through it and testing ultimately that you draw the right thing on the screen, that high level behavior um, where you can literally like have it make a screenshot and diff it with the screenshot that you're supposed to have, that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> I'm not a front end engineer um, as y'all will <laughs> readily appreciate when you see the quality of the UI in the demo. Um, but this is, uh, so I can't t tell you too much about the details of this, um, but the, I think what that community is doing is really cool. Um, it's really forward thinking. Um, and I wanna draw attention to one thing in particular that's a feature of some of these tools, which is that they have the ability to automatically capture the behavior of the user or the developer who's using the tool. And that gives you that efficiency of, oh, I made my feature, I click through it, I know it works, and now that's my test, and I don't have to do any other work. Um, so that makes sense on the front end. It's easy to understand when you're thinking about a user clicking through a UI. And now I'm going to talk about um, how we kind of take that and move it to the back end and all across the whole stack and take that whole approach um, across um, your entire product stack. So in general, you could call this maybe like recording-based testing, um, where you are recording what's going in and out of your application while it's in the state where it's performing correctly um, at some high level, like at the level of the REST API that your microservice implements. Um, and you're doing that, and that is what defines the correct passing state for your test. So the way this would look ideally for an efficient API testing cycle is that you know, you're doing your work as a backend engineer, you write an endpoint for your microservice, um, you hit the endpoint with a bunch of requests um, you know, as you're developing it, and you, you're looking at the response coming back when you're curling that endpoint, and you see, oh, this makes sense. Um, now I just take that request and response pair, um, and that's my test for my microservice that is doing what it's supposed to do. Um, and there's a whole bunch of tools, which a lot of us use every day in our work um, developing new features, um, that you know, do this level of functionality, right? Postman, Insomnia, or um, MITM proxy is really great um, for both capturing and replaying traffic. It can do all kinds of things. So um, 
you know, there's a lot, been a lot of interest in building these types of tools. Um, the problem is how you deal with dependencies. So if you're trying to test your code at a high level by hitting an API endpoint or calling a high level function, um, the trouble you run into that we're, all, we're probably mostly all familiar with is that your dependencies on things like databases, your downstream microservices that some other team owns, um, the third party APIs that you're using, like you're pulling from the Facebook or Twitter API or whatever, um, all those things make it harder to get reproducible tests that are fast to set up and fast to run. Um, and so we've kind of been trying a variety of ways historically that have kind of evolved over the years of you know, doing engineering and ops to um, be able to test these types of things effectively. Uh, the first one is way that I'm going to talk about is kind of like, um, I call it stack in a box, um, where you have a bunch of Docker containers for all of the different services that your company um, has across all the different teams. And whichever ones you need, you just spin up an instance of them with Docker. Um, and this is great. I do this all the time for like various projects. Um, and you know, that's one of the reasons Docker is so useful. Um, the other way, which is a little, has a little bit more, you know, it's been around for longer from you know, the pre-Docker era, um, is just use traditional mocks, right? Um, where you write a mock implementation of whatever the dependency is and structure your code such that you can pass in the real thing when your app's running in production or the mock thing when it's running in test. Um, and so people have been doing all, both of these things for a lot of years, and you know, there's a lot of software dedicated to making them work well. Um, so like I said, Docker is really great for doing the stack in the box type approach. Um, the challenges you run into with that that a lot of you have probably seen is one, you have a lot of overhead, right? It can take a, if you have a bunch of test cases you want to run, and they're all dependent on you know having some Docker instance running that is you know one of the databases that your tests are running into, um, then it takes you know a good amount of overhead to make sure that that thing's spun up and clean every time every time you run a test case and if you don't do that then you run into the second bullet point which is the test isolation issue where you know you're you have a whole bunch of test cases they're all trying to write into a database and they clobber each other's records and depending on the order they run in you'll either be green or not green um, and it's flaky and frustrating to debug right so this is often you know, one of the challenges that you run into with that. Um, it's obviously something that can be overcome, but you know, it's, it can be a little bit of a hassle sometimes. Um, so mocks don't have that problem, or largely don't have that problem. Um, and so you know, a lot of us use those. Um, and that's kind of what this talk is about. But you know, these have their own sets of pain points, right? Um, you, you, depending on the quality of tooling available in your language, it can be really easy to generate these. Um, but it still can be something of a pain, even even if the tooling's pretty good to um, write and refactor them across a whole bunch of tests that are all using um, the same mocks and mocking weird, different, intricate behavior um, over the lifespan of the test. Um, they kind of having to mock a whole bunch of dependencies can kind of force you into a particular coding style where you have to pass in all the dependencies down through the stack. Um, it can be a good or a bad thing, but it does kind of restrict you. Um, and one of the problems is it can be a little bit too easy to test, assuming, to mock away all the stuff that makes your dependencies tricky and interesting um, and all the things that you actually need to kind of work around. Um, you're, real deep database probably has some kind of interesting behaviors that testing against a real thing will reveal to you and cause you to you know, put the right guards in your code to handle that. Whereas if you, all your tests run against like a mock, um, the mock just be behaves the way you tell it to behave. Um, and that may not represent production as well. Um, so this is kind of a new way that I've been thinking about doing this. This has been my kind of hobby project for a little while and now I'm trying to take it a little bit more mainstream. So um, what you can do is you can make mocks, but you make them from real traffic, so the behavior of the real system by capturing the traffic and then automatically generating the mocks from that. Um, then you run your app in an isolated environment where it can only see, interact with those mocks. They pretend to be the real network dependencies of your application. Um, this has a lot of nice properties, right? It's very reproducible. You control the exact sequence of TCP messages that your app sees, all of them. 
Um, so it's perfectly isolated, um, perfectly reproducible, and it's very fast um, because you don't have to deal with actually booting up a whole real database and waiting for it to be ready and then hitting it with your test traffic. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what that would look like in um, kind of a specific application. So imagine that you've got a you know kind of typical case where you have some web app um, and clients are talking to it, and in the course of fulfilling the client request, it talks to some downstream microservice, um, talks to a database, and uh, then fulfills the client request. Um, so if we want to in make automated tests for this type of system really, really fast, um, then what we can do is just throw a proxy configured in a particular way in between both the inbound and outbound edges of that diagram and collect everything going in and out. Um, and so Docker has some really nice API features combined with a little IP tables wizardry that lets you actually just do this very easily. And so that's what our app does. Um, it doesn't work for anything except Docker yet. You gotta put this disclaimer out there, but it will. Um, so if there's a particular deployment that you want it to work for, like a particular type of VM or something, come talk to me, I can prioritize it. Um, so this is what we do. And then um, those proxies collect the traffic. They send it um, to our backend, and then we make the mocks. Um, so the outbound traffic, so let me go back real quick, the traffic from that right proxy, all the outbound traffic from your application, that's what we use to make the mocks of the dependencies. The inbound traffic from the left box, um, that becomes the definition of your integration test. So that's the behavior that the client is expecting from your application. So let's uh, do a demo here real quick. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. All right, so we're gonna start an example application to test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so, all right, how, how, how does that look? Can people read it? All right, great. So, um, so I fired up Docker Compose, and what that's doing now is making this site, which I'll also zoom here. Um, so, kind of just this example photo manager thing. And just to illustrate the type of data that we capture. So it lets us create photo albums and upload photos. And so we've got that running. Now I'm gonna come back over to the terminal and make that bigger again momentarily. We're gonna start collecting the traffic from that application. Um, using this traffic gatherer binary, which is like a single binary, that's all, that's all you need. Um, and so this is the one command from the talk abstract that um, does all this. Um, and let's, uh, let me just fire up the dependency real quick. Um, I think I killed one of these when I was uh, closing all my terminal tabs, ironically, so that it would be easier to get this thing set up. So I'll start that again. Um, and then we'll get this going. There we go. That'll run. All right. So now we're gonna gather the um, traffic from the application. And so that's gonna start going. And what it's gonna do is it's going to install a, a CI certificate into our container so that we, the container will trust the proxy 
This allows us to intercept uh, encrypted traffic as well, um, just like MITM proxy can do. And it happens automatically. Um, so it modifies the trust settings of the container, um, and then it unmodifies them when you're done. And then it just starts collecting traffic. Um, and so right here, you can actually see um, we already have some traffic, even though we haven't hit the application yet, which is kind of interesting, um, because it, it restarts the container um, so that it can intercept everything. It doesn't miss something that's going over an already established connection. Um, and so you kind of just find interesting stuff about your app from, like, you know, what you, you know, stuff you didn't know just from looking at this stuff. Like, it's kind of interesting. Um, this is MySQL um, starting up, and MySQL actually is a server-first protocol. The server sends the first message, which is kind of unusual. Um, so you can see that upon container startup, these are the things it depends on. Um, it has to establish a connection to the MySQL instance, and it has to also talk to S3 um, a little bit, which is what this is. You can see the requests creating uh, an example bucket um, for S3. Um, where our photos will live when we upload them. Um, this is using local stack, which is great. If you all haven't used it, it's pretty awesome. It's like it just um, fake and um, you know all AWS services. You can run them locally. Um, so it pretends to be S3. So that's what our container does when it starts up. And uh, then let's now actually go and use the app and see how that impacts the traffic that we see. So I'm going to create an album. And that's going to go. I created an album. And you can see that we, we see the traffic from that already. So this is collected in this trace. You can see like what it's doing. Um, it's posting to create the album. Um, and then it gets like a 302 back, um, a redirect. And it redirects to show the page with the album. Um, so now we'll go ahead and upload an album, um, or upload a photo to the album. Pops up there. You can see we get the traffic for that, too. So we have this whole flow um, of you know, what the app is doing in response to all the requests it received to, uh, receives to um, do, use this feature. Um, and so now, now we're done. That kind of um, that's enough traffic to make an interesting test. So we're going to go over here. Um, I'm going to stop collecting. And now that I'm done, um, it's going to give me the option to save that trace as a flow, um, something, a sequence of actions that can be replayed by us. So I'm going to do that. And now I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to look at that flow. So again, I'm a back-end engineer, so don't judge the UI. I'm trying to find a contract <laughs> front-end guy to make it better. Um, but you can kind of see the essentials of what's going on here. So I've got the messages, all the messages between the client and the target. So the client is the, the browser, and the target is the container where my application is running. And then I've got these messages from the target to the downstream, um, which is either downstream microservice or a dependency like S3 or MySQL. Um, and so that's what you can see. Um, and so all of that's captured. Um, and so now um, we can replay it. Um, and so you can replay it. You can pick the image you want to run it against. Um, and it'll start running it. Um, and so that's going to start running in the background. Um, and then we'll see what, and basically what it's going to do is it's going to take a copy of the Docker image. Um, of your application. Um, we have tools where you, you can snapshot not just you know, the information that's encapsulated in the image itself, but the information that's encapsulated in the container itself. So we know the com specific command that you ran to create that con uh, container instance, and also like what files it's using, and what you know, the environment variables, all that stuff. It captures all of that, so it can be exactly reproduced. Um, and then. We'll replay these requests against it and see if it returns the same thing. Um, and now I want to point out one uh, finer point, which is that you'll notice a lot of this stuff, um, 
you know, in applic typical applications like this, you'll have like some UUIDs floating around, right? Like I want to make an album, so I'm going to create a database record and I'm going to make a unique ID for that album to live under. And that's randomized, right? So that's going to be different every time. Um, so that complicates writing tests for this kind of thing. Um, we recognize common classes of parameters like this. So it'll just automatically figure out that this time when you're running it, the UUID is this new value, and then it'll expect that value in all the places where it saw the old UUID value. Um, so parameterization like that, it's a pain, but you really do need it for a tool like this, um, because otherwise it's just not turnkey enough. So once you've run it, you can come over here, and we can see that this ran. Um, and so you can see like these are the logs from the target container. So there are our Docker image. Um, and uh, it like runs. You can see it gets some HTTP requests. Um, and it goes through the whole flow. Um, and then if you want, you can look at the, the messages it sent during the replay. These will have different UUIDs um, because it generated new ones. Um, and yet it's still able to figure out what's going on and whether your application is preserving the behavior that it is supposed to have. Um, so this is kind of a nice um, sort of normal case for this type of um, flow. But it gets harder when you have, um, let me skip through back to where I was. So it gets harder once you have um, concurrent requests. So if you imagine you want it, you, because it's nice, and it's where everyone should start to try doing this kind of thing on your dev machine, right? Where you have your copy of the new feature that you wrote, and you want to make some tests from it. But you can also do cool stuff like capture production traffic. And this is very useful if you have a whole bunch of users. They're using your site. And you want to, um, if you're doing something like, for example, what the folks talking right before me did, where they are, um, right, you know, they need to move from one deployment on some hardware to like a different cloud provider, a new hardware, and you're like, what's that going to cost? You know, how's it going to handle the load? The fastest way to get load tests that are accurate, they have high fidelity, they accurately represent what your system actually experiences when it's under load from your customers, is just to you know, capture this stuff. Um, so if you want to do that, it's great to just capture production traffic. Um, but it's hard to figure out how that groups into reproducible flows. Because if you imagine this situation where I got two users at one time, and one of them sending me a get and one of them sending me a post. Um, and then in resp those requests take a while. My app does some processing in between. And, the, and then it sends two messages, one for each request, a write and a read, to the DB does some more stuff, and then sends something back. When I look at this trace, and I've collected all this traffic, well, what goes with what, right? I don't know which of those DB messages go with which upstream request. Um, so I don't know how, the, how those dependencies are um, linked together, right? I've labeled them. Like, we know what goes with what, so they have the same, um, they have the same colors. But uh, in, the in the real world, I don't know. Um, but we can figure that out um, through the way that our replay works. Um, and so I'll kind of show you that in action. Um, so let's go back over to the terminal and run one more of these. So I'm going to start a simpler container that I'm going to harvest the traffic from. Um, and it's just going to have. Um, one is going to be one, one, one application container with one dependency that pretends to be a database. And then I'm going to send some requests to it. Um, so first, I'm going to start gathering from it. Doing the same thing I was doing before. And then I'm going to start sending some requests to it. So in this case, once it pops up with the trace window that's showing what it gathered, it won't have any messages in it right away because that, doesn't, that application doesn't have any startup traffic. But I'm going to put some messages in it now. So I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to just issue a curl. Um, Oh, 
what? Oh, port. All right. Oh, 6K. There we go. And so you can see then that um, these are all nicely in sequence. And actually, if I hit a different URL, Yeah, that's the one I want. I have each of those requests come in. And you can see they send the request. Your target container receives the request. It talks to the database. And then it sends a result back. Then it does it again and again, once for each client. Um, but if I do something more representative of real production traffic, where I run them all at the same time, then Mm, this gets nasty, right? It receives all the messages from all the clients at the same time, does all the database work, um, and then sends everything back to the clients. And it's all jumbled together. You can't figure out what's going on. And so then this is not something that you can make a test out of. So instead, what we're um, so we're going to go ahead and replay that. Um, with and see how it can disentangle that. So I'm going to kill the trace, and I'm going to save it. And I'm going to replay it. So it recognizes that there's multiple clients. And so it, do, it needs to break it up into the flow that each client is executing. Um, so I can start replaying it, and it'll run. Um, and it's going to break it up into pieces where you can see what in each individual client was doing. Um, so we'll wait for that to run. Um, since I'm running low on time, I'm going to go finish the small number of slides I have left. Um, no, no, I have to do this again. And then we'll go back and look at that. So yeah, so this is kind of in like you know almost beta phase right now. Um, and so kind of looking to figure out where to prioritize going with this. Um, and I love feedback from everyone who's interested in this type of stuff. Um, one way this can go is to do performance testing, um, because you have an exact representation of the load that you receive from the clients. Um, and so you can very accurately predict um, the performance of your application in production by running it through these tests. You just capture your traffic, and then you replay it at like 10x volume. Um, this kind of helps with this kind of standard conundrum of doing performance testing, which is if you just like run a bunch of load against your dev box, that doesn't give you a very good indication of how that's going to perform in production. Um, but if you do it in prod, then you break all your production hosts because you put them under too much load. And then you've now caused the downtime that you were trying to avoid. Um, so that's a big pain. Um, so yeah, if you, do, if you do it with this, you can record it once, you replay anywhere. And uh, it'll let you understand the performance characteristics of that application. Um, so the other thing we want to do is figure out how to um, you know, get this working on other stacks, um, maybe add some chaos testing type features like Netflix, um, and you have it give you more optimization information. Um, so right now it's just me working on this, and I don't have any money. So I like figuring out how to prioritize this is important. Um, so if you guys are interested in this type of thing and you want, um, you know, you think one of these features would be useful, then tell, um, tell me about that. Um, so yeah, this is about to go into beta. Um, so you can sign up for the beta on the site. Um, it's right here, right down at the bottom, um, if this is something you're interested in. And uh, yeah, so um, I think this new way of testing shows a lot of promise. Um, it's got good um, to get you know, good coverage, good quality, very fast. Um, so you know, even if you aren't using this tool, you know, there's other ones. There's like if you Google mocks, mock generator, like there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that can kind of try to do something similar. So try it out. Try moving up your test to a higher level and see how you feel about that, how that impacts your organization, um, and whether you feel like it makes you more productive in your devs and your ops. Um, and that's all I have. So thank you.